All right, well, good evening, everybody. We're uh, picking up where we left off last time, so what we will do is I will open us in prayer, and then uh, we'll just jump right into this. That way uh, we can make sure that we finish. So let's go to the Lord. God, we just thank you so much that we're able to come together and we're able to um, study church history. And, and right now we're finishing up the intertestamental period or the second temple era. And so we just ask that you would be with me to where um, what I'm saying would be accurate and true and um, really help us understand um, the New Testament context and then the subsequent history of the church. Uh, we pray that uh, you'll be with everyone here and bless them um, for wanting to know more about what you have been doing for the last 2,000 years and even before that, God. And so we just thank you for everything. We pray this all to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, continuing with what, uh, what I was talking about last time, this second lesson, of course, it's taken me two lectures to get through the second lesson, but it's about the intertestamental period because you have a big chunk of time that happens between the close of the Old Testament and the start of the New Testament. And when you close the Old Testament and then you open the New Testament, there's things right out of the gate in the New Testament that require explanation. Things like Herod, Romans, Sadducees, Pharisees, um, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And, and why the New Testament's written in Greek rather than Hebrew. All that kind of stuff's important. And so to fill in that gap, that's why uh, I'm doing an intertestamental uh, lecture or series of lectures because it'll really help us understand the world that the church is born into. That way we're not just like jumping, parachuting into this blind. And so what I covered specifically is I, I, I went over how uh, when the Old Testament closed, you had the Persian Empire in control. Israel was allowed to go back to the land. Um, not all of them did go back to the land, but about 15% did. The rest stayed dispersed. And, and then you just had the Persians you know, calling the shots, and they were pretty hands-off. It was um, easy to live under the Persians, well, easier. And, um, and so what happened was the, the Jews were able to develop their Judaism during that time because it was relatively peaceful. But then you get this guy from Greece, Alexander the Great, who decides to destroy the Persian Empire, replace it, and spread Greek culture really all over the world. And the technical term for that was Hellenism. Alexander's idea was to make everyone Greek, one world, uh, government, one world language, one world culture, all that kind of stuff. Alexander, though, dies. He dies when he's young. And so his empire splits between four of his generals, and they kind of duke it out for a while. Then eventually it just ends up being a division four ways. And two of those divisions, you have the Ptolemies who ruled Egypt and the Seleucids who ruled Syria, and they're constantly fighting and tug of warring with each other for control of that region. And guess what's right in between them? Israel. And so when the Ptolemies, the ones ruling Egypt, were in charge of Israel, they kind of left Israel alone for the most part. And so during that time, Israel flourished. They were able to create a Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. It was actually created in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, and so you had good relations there. But then eventually that Syrian group, the Seleucids, well, the Greek Syrian group, they come, they defeat the Ptolemies in Egypt, they take Israel, and, uh, and pretty much what they do is they try to stamp out Judaism. You know, you're going to be Greek. You're going to speak Greek. You're going to worship Zeus. You're going to stop worshiping Yahweh. You're going to stop circumcising your kids. You're going to do all that stuff, you know, um, all, all the Greek pagan stuff. And so a lot of Jews gave in, but quite a few revolted under the Maccabees. So you had this uh, really impressive war where the Maccabees fought for their independence and where the Jews were independent. But what happened is the family of the Maccabees made themselves kings, and they should have never been kings. They weren't from the right tribe. They became corrupt, and so they were almost as bad as the Greeks at some point. And so eventually what happens is the Roman Empire comes in, um, defeats the Seleucid Empire, what remained of that, takes over the Ptolemies in Egypt, and then takes over Israel. Okay? And at first, Rome kind of had a hands-off policy, and was working well with the Jews. They eventually appoint a guy named Herod to be king of the Jews, even though he wasn't a Jew. But it's around that time tensions between the Jews and the Romans will, will start to rise. One, because of taxation. Two, because of this corrupt king. And then eventually um, the Romans really start putting their boot on the throats of Israel. 
a, a lot more after a really big revolt happened in, in the year 86. In fact, um, I was alluding to this last time, in that year, the Romans crucified 2,000 people outside of a town in Galilee that was walking distance from Nazareth. Jesus would have been about anywhere between 10 to 12 years old. So imagine the little boy Jesus and the town right over the Romans publicly crucify 2,000 people. That's one of the memories he would have had as a boy. And, and that was really the beginning of when the Roman oppression started to get, uh, get pretty severe. So, uh, so that's kind of where we left off. I did bring up some of the, the Greek culture, like the, their religion um, and the philosophies. We talked about uh, Plato, Aristotle. Uh, you know, makes me think of the whole um, um, Princess Bride joke where the little bald guy's like, you ever hear of Plato, Aristotle, morons, you know? So we talked about those morons, you know? Um, we, we talked about, uh, you know, the philosophers. We talked about the Epicureans, the Stoics, and, and all that kind of stuff. And then I kind of ended um, with the influence of Hellenism, the Greek contributions, such as the Greek language. Last thing we talked about was how the New Testament's written in, in Greek. Um, and I even, you know, read uh, John chapter 1, verse 1 in Greek, and it's still up there on the screen. But with all that, we're now ready to move on and, and finish. And so after the Greek contribution, what we want to talk about are Roman contributions, okay? And so the, the Romans, it's going to be a little different. Obviously, when you study the Greeks, the Greeks were some pretty deep thinkers. They had these philosophers, um, you know, they, they had this, this very detailed religion. Um, they had a very uh, defined art and culture. The Romans weren't like that. The Romans were more mechanical. They were pragmatists. They weren't the thinkers. They were the guys who just say, how do you get it done, right? <laughs> What's the most efficient way to do it? And so they weren't philosopher problem taking the philosophy of those who were philosophers. What we can say about the Romans is as they developed as a growing empire, they created one of the most sophisticated governments the world had ever seen up to that point. Um, even before they became an empire, I don't know if you realize this, in 508 BC, they founded the world's first republic, Republic, which comes from the word, uh, the Latin res publica. Um, and America is a republic, and we modeled ours off of theirs. I'm sure when you were a kid, you learned that, hey, we're against monarchy. And so what did we do? We separated the powers of government into three branches, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. We were not the first ones to do that. The Romans did that. And, and they were very much, because they overthrew a monarchy, uh, an Etruscan monarchy in a revolutionary war, and they're like, we're never going to have a king again. And so they built their empire, much like we did, as a three-branch system of government. Okay, They built it as a, a three-branch system of government, um, and then what happens is by the time you get to Caesar Augustus, um, or actually by the time you get to Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar tries to make himself the first king in like 500 years. And a guy named Brutus assassinates him. You want to know what's ironic about that? The guy who assassinated the last king 500 years earlier was also named Brutus, came from the same family. That's when you know it's in your bloodline to kill tyrants. <laughs> you know, um, so Julius Caesar gets murdered and then his nephew, Octavius, um, slickly becomes the first Roman emperor. And how he pulled it off was amazing. I wrote a big paper about him in college. He was smart enough to say, okay, if you declare yourself to be dictator for life, they're going to kill you. So instead, he became the head of each of the three branches. The people chose him to do that. And so he held all positions at the same time. Imagine if in America, one person was the president, the Speaker of the House, and the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. You could still say, hey, this isn't a monarchy. We got three branches. And yet you got one guy ruling all three branches. That's what Caesar Augustus did. And he was the first to do it. And he reigned for 40 years and created a peaceful Roman Empire to where by the time he died, people were like, wait a minute. He was a king, an emperor. But it wasn't so bad. And so then it continued. And then Tiberius became the next emperor. And what's interesting about that is if you think about it, Augustus was the emperor when Jesus was born. Okay, so the first Roman emperor just arrived only a few decades before Jesus was born. Okay, so the, the New Testament actually starts very early in the imperial phase of, of Rome. But my point is for Rome to become rich and to expand, they had to absorb a lot of the technology and philosophy and, and all that stuff from the people they conquered. They had to be really good at trade, economics, commerce. They built roads. 
that connected everything. And then those roads led everything back to the heartbeat, which was Rome. That's why back then they'd say all roads lead to Rome. They did. And so by setting up these roads, by setting up their army everywhere, having uh, all the sea routes figured out for trade and, and war, they were able to administer a large empire. And then, of course, if the people they conquered were, like, docile, they would let their own kings rule. If they weren't docile, like some of us feisty Hebrews, then they would set a governor over you, somebody like Pontius Pilate. Either way, they were able to maintain control of a very large empire. I mean, it went all the way from Germany down to North Africa, from Israel all the way to England. I mean, think about how big of, of a stretch of land that actually is and all the cultures that were, were ruled by them. Now, if you were born in Italy, you were born as a citizen of the Roman Empire. If you were a citizen, you had rights that everybody else didn't have. Tell me if these sound familiar. You're innocent till proven guilty. Most cultures of that time, you're actually, you actually have to prove yourself innocent. If you're a Roman citizen, it's up to people to prove your guilt. If they can't, you walk free. So innocent till proven guilty. Written law is the ultimate standard, not people who represent those, uh, those offices. Again, it's almost constitutional, not quite, but you could say it's the, the foundation of the idea. All that stuff was there at that time. Now, if you weren't born in Italy, it was still possible to become a citizen because you wanted to be a citizen if you could. So if you paid a boatload of money, you could be a citizen. It's a lot of money though. Most people will never have that much money. Or if you joined the Roman army and served for 20 years, you got to retire, military retirement, and you retired as a citizen. And then all your kids henceforth are born as citizens. So if I get conquered, but I realize this empire is the way of the future, why fight it? Join it, put on their, their, uh, their armor. They're gonna send me to another part of the world, get to travel, and then after 20 years, I get to retire as a citizen and my kids become citizens. That's another way to get the conquered to now become more loyal to you, right? Very genius. Or another way is you do something so great that the emperor or the senate is like, you know what, you did such a huge thing that benefited the empire, we're gonna award your family citizenship. Now, when you read the New Testament, by the time you get there, it's probably less than 10% of the whole empire's citizens, maybe even less than that. But does anybody know what New Testament figure was a Roman citizen? Paul. Paul. And there's a time where the Romans start beating him, and he says, you beat a Roman citizen without a trial. And then they freaked out because even the, the government officials that beat him weren't citizens yet. They hadn't done their 20 years. And the thing is, Rome took citizenship so seriously that if they found out one of the cities actually beat a citizen without trial, they would come in and kill those government officials and replace them. Like, you don't treat our citizens that way. Um, if you were a citizen, you couldn't be crucified. If you're going to be executed, it's the quick head chop off, you know, a um, little less painful. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the Roman Empire was, was pretty sophisticated for its time. Um, and so, yeah, citizens were protected under the law, innocent until proven guilty. Um, and Paul, when he wasn't getting justice in Israel, he appealed to Caesar. Now, you know what that means? Since he was a citizen, he was able to make an appeal to Caesar, which guaranteed he would have a trial by the emperor himself. If you're a citizen, you could pretty much say, hey, I want the emperor to decide my case. And then they had to put him on a boat and send him all the way to Rome, where he waited two years um, to stand before the emperor and make his case. And so kind of cool. I mean, that's even beyond what we as citizens have. It's not like you could say, I appeal to the president, you know, and then you get trial by president. Um, but in that time, Paul was able to do that. Um, so yeah, citizens would only be beheaded. Um, I, as I mentioned, Paul took advantage of his citizenship a couple times. I mentioned the roads. Pax Romana, Roman peace. Um, there was about a hundred year period where there were not major wars. And that was when Christianity was born, okay? So when the apostles and the early missionaries are spreading the gospel throughout the empire, they're not having to worry about walking into war-torn areas where, oh, we can't go there because we might get captured or killed by uh, opposing armies. They didn't have to worry about that. Again, when the fullness of the time had come, that's what Galatians says, that Jesus was born under the law um, of a woman, and pretty much it was when the fullness of the time came. God picked the time when there would be an empire that had everything united under one language, one road system, and in a time of peace. 
in a time where there were Jews in every city, a synagogue in every city. Everybody already knew who the God of Israel was. They already had a Greek Bible. I'll kind of repeat some of that at the end. It really was the fullness of the time. The world stage was set perfect. And that's why Jesus came in the time when he did. God set everything up for this. Okay. And so it demonstrates God's sovereignty, God's sovereignty over history, God's sovereignty over everything. Luke chapter two, verses one through six makes it clear that it was even a decree by Caesar Augustus himself that forced Joseph to have to leave Nazareth to go back to Bethlehem for a census, for, for census data. And that's when Jesus was born. So he'd be born in the right place, right? All that was under the, the, the leading and guidance and providence of God. So next, I'll talk a little bit about Roman religion, okay? Um, so there's three different, I guess you could say, kinds of Roman religion that you, you want to know about. Uh, the first was emperor worship, and that's going to become something that's a, a bit of a big deal, especially when you get to the later time of the New Testament. Um, emperor worship was not something that started out, okay? But there comes a point where all citizens were required to declare that uh, Kaiser Kurios, Caesar is Lord. Okay, there's a reason why the New Testament, it's a very political statement when we say, uh, you know, uh, Christos is Kurios, you know, uh, Jesus is Lord. It's not Caesar, it's Jesus who's Lord. And that's why the confession Jesus is Lord actually carried the death penalty by the end of the first century. Now, at the beginning of the first century, or actually in the 30s when Christianity first started, that wasn't a big deal yet. Um, because the Romans naturally did not think their emperors were gods. That's a Greek thing. Remember when Antiochus IV was trying to destroy the Jews and he called himself Antiochus Epiphanes, meaning Antiochus, God in the flesh or manifested? Greek rulers did believe they were gods. Their people believed they were gods. The Romans were like, yeah, that's kind of silly. Now, when the Roman Empire has, is in full swing, the western half of the empire, which was more Roman culture, still did not believe their emperors were gods, but they believed the office of emperor was godlike. but they wouldn't say each emperor was a god. But in the eastern half of the empire, where Greek culture had been floating around for a long time, they believed the Roman emperors were gods. And that's where they started what was called the imperial cult, where they worshiped the emperor, they poured libation, a, a wine pouring down at the foot of a statue, and, uh, and those who wouldn't do that would be arrested or killed. And that's what's going on when John is writing the seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Okay? A lot of it has to do with these guys aren't willing to pour the libation at the feet of Domitian. And they're getting in trouble for it. Now, by the time you get to the end of the first century, the Roman emperors were flattered at this and did start thinking of themselves as gods and would then start putting you know, the force of death on those who would not make this confession that Caesar is Lord and then worship him with this wine. By the time you get to the second, third, and early fourth centuries, it's, it's far worse. They do believe they're gods. They'll kill you for um, just about anything, right? So emperor worship developed, and this is going to be the most dangerous thing for Christians. But during the time that the New Testament was written, up except for Revelation, Revelation's the one exception, this wasn't a factor yet, so it was still safe. Once this comes into play, emperor worship, uh, a lot of our ancient brothers and sisters are going to get killed, and they're going to get killed um, in massive numbers. Now, another factor of Roman religion was syncretism. Um, does anybody know what syncretism is? You probably heard this word before. It's where you start to think all religions are the same. Let's just blend them together. So if the Greeks say Zeus is the king, God, king of the gods, but we Romans say Jupiter is the king of the gods, hey, Jupiter and Zeus are the same guy. So we don't have to say Jupiter could beat up Zeus. You know, we could just say Jupiter is Zeus. And so pretty much what you have here is you have, uh, you end up having uh, Zeus equaling Jupiter, Hera equaling Juno, Hermes equaling Mercury, Poseidon is Neptune, Aphrodite is Venus, Aries is Mars, Hades is Pluto, Kronos is Saturn, okay? And so um, it wasn't always that way, but eventually they start to just see it all that way. Hey, we all worship the same thing. We just call it by different names. And for the Romans, this is a very practical way to, to run an empire because if you conquer people and they're praying to their gods for deliverance, you could say, hold on, we worship the same gods. And these gods are the ones that let us conquer you. So they're on our side. You might as well be on our side as well. So it's a very strategic thing uh, to do. Now, in our day, people tend to be uh, syncretistic as well. 
Um, but not for this pragmatic reason. They really foolishly just do believe all religions are the same when they're not. You know, the law of contradiction and non-contradiction prove that the religions are not the same. Now, um, yeah, so I already said that, like when, when other religions are, are conquered, they're adopted, they're absorbed within the Roman religion. So most local religions were called legal religions because the Romans would absorb them and say, hey, that's legal. You could worship these gods. Now, there were illegal religions. So a legal one was religio licita, and then uh, an illegal one was religio illicita. You can see where some of our, our words come from even today. The interesting thing is they did not absorb the Jewish religion. They're like, these Jews are an obstinate, stubborn, stiff-necked, backward people, but they will die to the last man if we try to make them change. So we will let the Jews be the Jews. They don't have to serve in the military, and they don't have to worship our gods. And we won't let any of our people go in their temple because that really ticks them off. So they gave the Jews an exception. But they did say they better pay their taxes. And so, um, that, you know, that, that did happen. Now, Christianity was not seen as an illegal religion at first because the Romans couldn't tell the difference between Christianity and Judaism. They thought Jews and Christians were the same because for a long time they were. Okay, But eventually, especially after Rome destroys Jerusalem, the Jews were very mad at the Christian Jews um, that were in Jerusalem because they fled Jerusalem before the Romans burned it down. So they're like, you traitors, you should have died with us. And they're like, we're just listening to Jesus. He said, flee to the mountains when we see these, mount when we see these armies. Um, and so the, the, a lot of the Jews were so mad that the Christian Jews did that, that they pretty much said, you guys aren't Jews. And they started putting curses in their, um, their worship services to the Nazarenes, um, as they called them, the Nitrim. And, uh, and once the Romans caught wind of that, like, wait a minute, these, these Christians, we just thought like the Jewish religion was growing, you know, and Gentiles were becoming Jews, but you're telling us these aren't actually Jews? And the Jewish leader said, yep, they're not Jews. And at that point, Christians now had to pour the wine at the statue and confess Caesar as Lord. As long as the Romans thought the Christians were Jews, they didn't have to do that. Again, because the Jews were a protected religion. Christians, after that stage, became an illegal religion, and that's when things got a lot harder, okay? But anyway, so you have emperor worship, you have synchristic worship, and then you have the mystery religions. I don't know if you've heard of the mystery religions, but the mystery religions, um, some people tend to be bored with their own indigenous religion. Yeah, the Roman gods are boring. You know, I want to follow a Persian god, so I'm going to follow Mithras. Or I want to follow an Egyptian god, so I'm going to follow uh, uh, Isis. Or, you know what, those Semitic uh, Asians in the lower part of Turkey, or Asia Minor as they called it then, they follow Sybil, the, the, the uh, Mother Earth goddess. And so we want to follow them. And so the mystery cults would take a foreign god and then put their own little Roman spin on it to where like the, the people they're stealing the religion from would say, that's not what we believe. They'd be like, well, who cares? <laughs> we're going to do what we want with it. And so with the mystery cults, the, the three big ones were Sybil, Isis, and, and Mithras. And Mithras, um, actually, by the 3rd and 4th century, became the chief rival to Christianity. Um, now, it came on the scene after Christianity. So Mithraism stole from Christianity, not the other way around. They stole the December 25th birth date. Even though Christ wasn't born on December 25th, they still stole that birth date because Christians were starting to say they thought Jesus was born on that day. Um, they stole the idea of baptism. But the difference was you weren't baptized in water. They, you would stand in a, a pit and there'd be a wooden uh, grate over you. And then they would sacrifice a bull right above you. And all of its blood has to fall on you. You have to drink it. And then you have to show that every square inch of your body is covered in blood. And then you're baptized in blood. And you're now, you've done this initiation ritual. And you're part of the, the, the Mithras cult. And then the promise was you'll have eternal life after you die. You know, regular Roman and Greek religion didn't focus on that. You didn't know if you were going to have eternal life. It wasn't a, a, an emphasis in those religions. But with the mystery cults, there was the promise of immortality, not a physical resurrection, but immortality in some sense. And so the mystery cults do compete with Christianity in the sense that it's devotion to one single savior type God. It's not a Roman or Greek God. It's a uh, foreign and at the same time, there's an initiation ritual, there's the promise of eternal life, and there's a really tight-knit community. But when it came to these mystery cults, just to let you know, they were very promiscuous morally. 
um, and, and they did weird things like bathe in blood and drink blood and, and all that kind of stuff. And so the Romans considered the mystery religions illegal as well. And so sometimes they would hunt them down. Uh, sometimes they would, uh, you know, tolerate them. It just, it just depended. But those are the three main forms of, uh, of religion. The one thing I will add that's not on this slide is God-fearers. So as Judaism, as Judaism spread without, throughout the Roman world, and you had a Greek translation of the Old Testament, and you had synagogues and kosher markets in every major city, there's going to be some Gentiles who start showing up to the synagogue, and they start listening to the scripture being read in Greek, and they're like, we believe in that God. The Roman gods don't make any sense. Uh, Plato didn't go far enough on who the one God could be and all that. So you do get a, a significant group of people that align themselves with Judaism, but they don't want to get circumcised. I guess you can't blame them. And so they wouldn't become Jews or proselytes. They would be called God-fearers. Um, they were allowed to ten, attend synagogue, but they didn't have full citizenship within Israel. They were considered righteous Gentiles. Um, and so that would be a, a, another form of, of religion. And that's one reason why the Romans, when Gentiles first started becoming Christians, they weren't too suspicious because they already knew a lot of Gentiles already believed in the God of Israel. So they didn't really think much of it. Now, that covers Roman religion. Before I move on to Jewish religion, I always, when applicable, try to bring out some books. And so I mentioned some, uh, you, you want to, if you can, start with primary sources. This is the Annals of Rome from Tacitus. He was a second century uh, writer who more or less chronicles the history of Rome and its emperors. And he mentions Jesus. He mentions Pontius Pilate. He mentions Nero killing the Christians and, and blaming them for starting a fire that they didn't start. He's the one who tells us he thinks Nero started the fire and then used the Christians as a scapegoat. So again, you kind of learn some interesting things about the Roman Empire there. Suetonius also wrote on the Caesars. It's called the Twelve Caesars. He also mentions Jesus, and he tells us that because of arguments over Jesus, or Christus as he calls him, that Emperor Claudius kicked the Jews out of Rome um, in the year roughly 49. And when you read the book of Acts, it tells us the same thing. So you see a, a correspondence between that. And then, of course, when it comes to understanding um, the mystery cults, The Golden Ass is an is a interesting book on this. And so um, this is a book that's propaganda for the cult of Isis. So it starts off with a guy who's just a regular uh, Roman pagan, and uh, he, he, he's intrigued with witchcraft. He hears there's a witch in a particular area, so he goes to live in that house. He falls in love with the slave girl of that witch who knows a little bit about magic herself. There's some inappropriate stuff that happens, but he convinces that slave girl because he watches the mistress turn herself into a bird with a potion. He's like, I want to do that. So then the slave girl gets him the wrong potion, and it turns him into a donkey, hence the title, the golden ass. And so pretty much she tells him, this is easy to fix. We just have to find rose petals, okay? we got to find some rose petals. If you eat the rose petals, you'll turn back into a human. Pretty weird. Well, before they can find the rose petals, some robbers come into the town, kill everybody in the house, and then take the, the donkey with them. Hey, take the donkey with us. So now he's forced to live with these robbers in a cave. They don't know he's a man. So he kind of gets to hear uh, human conversations when they don't think another person's around. Well, long and short of that is um, they also kidnapped a woman who was engaged to some like stud. And that stud finds out what cave these robbers are in. So they come in and kill all the robbers and then say, yeah, take the donkey too. And so then the donkey ends up in, in their city. Um, and then in their city, certain things start to go wrong. They blame a particular, oh, and there's a little boy that's supposed to care for the donkey who abuses the donkey, um, just kind of weird. And then, um, and then something happens with a woman in the city. She's accused of witchcraft. So they're going to kill her publicly. But it's supposed to involve the donkey. I'm not going to say any more. Donkey's like, no way, I'm not buying into that. So the donkey flees, okay? And when the donkey uh, flees, what happens is Isis comes and uh, tells him, I'll show you where to get the rose petals. He then eats the rose petals. He becomes a human. And he's like, I'm going to devote myself to you, Isis. And then uh, ever since he does that, he becomes a, a very rich, wealthy man, eventually gets a city job. And so pretty much what this is saying is, hey, following Isis rather than the Roman gods is a good thing to do. And Roman government, we're not bad people. This guy, this character became a city official. So you have nothing to worry about. Again, it's propaganda, and it's also filled with all sorts of inappropriate stuff as well. But 
that's the type of stuff being written at that time. Right? So if you want to know more about the religions and the politics, those books I, I recommended, you know, they'll, they're not edifying, but you'll know a little bit about the time. Um, so with that, what I want to do is I want to move to Jewish culture. This is the most important piece, and I don't say that just because I'm Jewish. I say that because the Messiah is Jewish. The apostles are Jewish. The New Testament is written by Jewish people except possibly Luke. Um, and so, you know, it all is born out of Jewish expectation. Christianity is born out of Judaism. All that other stuff is important. You need to know it. But this is the, the without this piece, none of it makes sense. Okay. And so, again, um, what Christianity ultimately is, is we follow the Christ. Okay. Christ is just the Greek word that the Septuagint used to translate the Hebrew word Mashiach, Messiah. Okay. We follow the Messiah. We are believers in the Hebrew Messiah. We believe that the one that they had been waiting for forever had come in the person of Jesus, and he's going to come twice. And pretty much, the, in fact, one of the famous quotes in church history is that the history of the church is the delay of the parousia. If you don't know what the word parousia means, it means second coming. So what is the history of Christianity? Us waiting for Jesus to come back. Okay, he started, started it with his first coming. The church history is just everything that happens in between, okay? And so one thing we have to understand at this time about the Jews is they were a dispersed people. After the Babylonian captivity, I mentioned about 15% went back to Israel. Eventually, about half the world's Jewish population lived in Israel, just like it is today. The other half was both in the Parthian, Parthian Empire and in the, the Roman Empire, okay? And so they made lives for themselves in these Gentile cities. And, and so if you think of the, the, the Greek side of the world, they started speaking Greek, not Hebrew. Why do you think they needed a Greek translation of the Old Testament? The Septuagint. They built synagogues. This, the word synagogue is a Greek word, just to let you know. It's not Hebrew. Um, now, they existed in both Israel and abroad, but it's, it, the whole idea of a synagogue might have actually come from the Greeks. Um, so pretty much you, you have Jews scattered all over the world. They had their own kosher meat markets in those cities because they wouldn't eat the meat um, of the pagan Gentiles because they knew that meat was sacrificed to idols. Uh, so even living abroad, the Jews were still able to keep themselves as a separate, distinct people, as they always have. Um, now, of course, the ones that lived in Israel thought the ones abroad were compromised, and the ones that were lived abroad thought the ones in Israel were legalistic and stuffy-nosed. Um, so you will have um, some, I guess you could say, uh, animosity between them. Uh, but the point is, so many Jews were outside the land of Israel that they even built a second temple in Hierapolis, Egypt. Um, as I said, they made the Greek Old Testament, which is the Septuagint, uh, and all that paves the way for the spread of Christianity. Um, and so, yeah. Now, the one thing I do want to say, though, is both Jews, um, whether they lived in Israel or whether they lived in the diaspora, um, they believed in the Messiah and were expecting the coming of the Messiah. I'm not going to turn that off. Okay, so anyway, sorry. Um, but anyhow, both Jews in the land and in the diaspora expected uh, the Messiah to come. So that gives the big picture of the Jews. Um, if you're going to go, now's the time because I have this on the stream. You didn't even have to duck. Anyhow, so, so anyway, Jewish sectarianism. One thing you have to understand about, uh, about the Jews, especially in the land of Israel, there's different parties, if you will, different uh, sects, S-E-C-T-S, so sectarianism. Um, and so let me just go over them, because these guys come up in the New Testament. You've got the scribes. You always hear about that, the scribes and the Pharisees. Who were they? The scribes and the lawyers, they, they were responsible for copying the scriptures. And because they copied the scriptures, they knew the most about the scriptures. I mean, if you're in the word all day, you're exegeting it, you know the grammar, you know the clauses, you know what these words mean, you're going to be the Bible encyclopedia that everybody wants to go to for, for answers. Um, so where did they come from? We don't know, but it seems that Ezra was probably the first scribe. Because the way Ezra is described in the book of Ezra, he is the first and he's the model. And all scribes afterward tried to do what he did. Copy the word, explain the word, teach the word to the people. And so that's what scribes were known for. Um, so they were the experts on interpretation. The next group were the Pharisees. 
Uh, and these were the largest party. By the time of Herod, there's about 6,000 of them. That doesn't sound like a lot. But, I mean, if you think about it, a Pharisee would be like a, a seminary-trained level biblical teacher. 6,000 spread out in a little country like Israel is actually kind of a lot. Um, so they were the largest party. They were the most popular party. In, in other words, the people uh, agreed with their theology more than any of the other groups. Um, and I would say from a Christian standpoint, we would say they were the best of the Jewish uh, groups because they believed in the purity of the law. They believed that God was the loving father of Israel, that he was a judge, like a holy judge. They believed in personal responsibility, that you're supposed to love your neighbor. You're supposed to love God. They believe in the resurrection of the dead and an afterlife, and they believed in a literal messianic kingdom. They didn't allegorize um, this stuff. So if they're the good guys among the Jewish groups, why do they appear in the New Testament as the bad guys so much? Well, you know, sometimes the people you have the biggest problem with are the people who are most like you. I don't know if you ever realized that. You know, the people who are least like you, it's clear, the people who are least like you, um, are a lot of times you don't care what they think. Ah, those are those dumb Sadducees. They're, they don't even believe in the resurrection. I don't care what they say. But if somebody shares your theology and they get one point different than you, it's, it's amazing how the gloves come off and people start duking it out. And so um, I, I think that's one explanation of it. And another explanation of it is the Pharisees did become hypocritical. They became bigoted. Um, not all of them, but a lot of them, and they had a very legalistic, self-righteous attitude, and that's what Jesus was against. But let me tell you something, that has very little to do with Phariseeism itself and their doctrine. It has everything to do with having a hard heart, because there's a lot of Christians in our Reformed circles that are just as hard-hearted, just as legalistic, look down on the lost just as much as the Pharisees did, and are just as harsh towards other saved Christians who don't share their same I guess you could say party affiliation theologically, right? Anybody could be a Pharisee. Okay, so it wasn't the doctrine of the Pharisees. It was what they became. It's what power did to them, what status did to them. And it made a lot of them just people that <laughs> Jesus had a good reason to condemn a lot of them. Okay, now the Sadducees, they were the party that was in political power. Sometimes we call them the theological liberals. Some people say they were actually the ultra conservatives. In other words, that they, they did not believe in... Um, you know, the resurrection. They didn't believe in anything you couldn't find in the, the law of Moses. And so in that sense, maybe they're more conservative than liberal. But then on the other hand, I mean, they just went along with the Romans and they were fine with some degree of Hellenism because, again, it was the Hellenists that kept them in power. You know, the, the pro-Greeks, pro-Romans kept them in power. Um, so it kind of makes sense that they're pushing themselves away from Jewish doctrine and only holding on to the core doctrines that keep them in power. Um, so they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in any scriptures outside of the Torah or the first five books. And what's interesting is that makes no sense because in the first five books, you have angels, you have miracles, and you have Moses saying more prophets are going to come. Hence, you would expect there would be more writings after that. So again, the Sadducees are kind of a hard group to understand. It's just they don't make any sense. Um, now, another group that you don't hear about in the New Testament, but they're still famous nevertheless, and Josephus mentions them, are the Essenes. There's a couple thousand of them. And the Essenes, these were, uh, they, they, they shared theology with the Pharisees. But at some point, they thought the Pharisees and the Sadducees were corrupt, and so they believed they should separate themselves from society and go live in an isolated community out in the middle of the Dead Sea. So they came up with their own traditions. They came up with their own theology. And, and even though their theology in some ways matched the Pharisees, in other ways it was radically different. These are the people who wrote for us the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, you know, and so one thing we owe them is they wrote down every book of the Hebrew Bible. And what it showed is that the, the copies that we had a thousand years later were almost identical to the ones back then that the Jews preserved their word. Sometimes there were slight differences, but it didn't make a difference in what the text was saying. 
Um, and so that was kind of cool. But in addition to the, the biblical scrolls they copied, they also wrote their interpretations of the Bible. And that's how we know a lot about these guys and know a lot about what a lot of Jews believed in that time. And so I, I could bore you with the full history of how they all separated. Now I'm going to do that. So, so what happened is when the Maccabee revolt happened and Antiochus was overthrown and the Hasidim, the purists, right, had restored worship to Israel, it wasn't long before there was a disagreement among the Hasidim themselves. And so on one hand, you had uh, the, uh, a corrupt high priest who was appointed by the Greeks. Once the Greeks were gone, this guy shouldn't be the high priest, is what one group said. The other group said, no, it's okay. It doesn't matter. And so the group that said it wasn't okay became the Essenes. And they followed a man who actually was a descendant of Zadok, the right, true high priest. They follow him out into the wilderness. They call him the teacher of righteousness. And so when you read the Dead Sea Scrolls, they always talk about a battle between the teacher of righteousness and the wicked priest. These were real people, and we know who they're talking about. I, I can't remember the name, but the wicked priest, I think was John Hyrcanus, is, is what they were talking about. And then uh, the, the teacher of righteousness, um, we don't know his name, but we know who he thought the wicked priest was. Now, the Sadducees fully backed the wicked priest. The Essenes are like, we got to have our own separate society. The Pharisees said, you're both wrong, but it makes no sense to go live in the middle of nowhere. So we're just going to multiply our numbers, set up synagogues, and we will teach the people of Israel scattered throughout Israel rather than separate from the society. So that's where those, uh, those groups come from. Um, and again, Josephus tells us these guys, uh, they believed in like hardcore predestination, like humans don't even make choices, we're just robots. Um, they believed in a lot of uh, interesting stuff. Uh, but anyhow, the next group, and these guys are mentioned in the New Testament, they're the Zealots, which Josephus calls them the fourth philosophy, because if you have the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes, that's the first three, he then says there's a fourth philosophy. Guys who believe what the Pharisees believe, but they carry these crazy-looking curved knives, hence the picture, in their pockets, and their goal was to assassinate Romans and Jewish sympathizers with the Romans. And the reason they, they did this is, one, they thought it was, you can't have pagans in the Holy Land because that means other gods are being called upon, and God said that's not to happen. So they're kind of reading passages from, from like Joshua and stuff like that and saying, we got to carry that stuff out now. So they were... It, if you were to look at their tactics and how they operated and use today's definitions, we would say they were terrorists, you know, religious fundamentalist terrorists. They, they did not operate a whole lot different than Al-Qaeda. Um, and so they were, they were violent. They, again, carried the, the theology of the Pharisees. But they said, if you, like the Pharisees said, the Messiah will come if we could have one Shabbat or Sabbath where no one in Israel sins. Okay? They, they said that is when um, you would have the... Um, the Messiah come. The zealots said, no, the Messiah will come if we start a war with Rome. And then we're about to be defeated because Zechariah talks about, you know, Jerusalem being surrounded. And then the Messiah will show up on the Mount of Olives, which will happen at the second coming. But they were expecting that in the first coming. So they said, we just got to start the war with Rome. And then when we're about to be destroyed, Messiah will come and save us. And you want to know the irony with this? is the Zealots did start the war in the year 66, and the Romans did surround Jerusalem, and Messiah didn't show up. Jerusalem got burned to the ground. They all got killed, and a million Jews got killed along with them, and then the rest of us were uh, scattered off into exile, and that's why you have Ashkenazi Jews like me with a very light complexion because the Romans dragged my ancestors off into Russia, Poland, Ukraine. It's cold there. Your skin lightens a little bit, and then even you go bald. But anyhow, so... Um, so pretty much that was all because of the zealots having a bad eschatology, okay? Having a bad uh, view of the end times. So anyhow, like, like when it comes down to it, Messiah's not going to come because we start a war. Messiah's going to come because we get the gospel to every nation. And while that's happening, completely unrelated to what we're doing, a one world government arises and then tries to stamp out the church just because we're doing what Jesus told us to do. That's what's going to bring the second coming, not starting a revolution or storming the capital, you know, with flags with the president's name and turning the T into a cross, some of the stupidest stuff that's ever happened in my lifetime. That's not how the second coming comes. But anyhow, um, 
Next group mentioned in the scriptures were the Samaritans. You know, there are no Samaritans in the Old Testament. You have the start of them being mentioned, but they're not called Samaritans yet. Yeah, you get to the New Testament. Here you have this group of Samaritans. They live in Israel. They hate the Jews. The Jews hate them. Who are they? Well, they're, some, they're half-breeds. Um, and and, and the, way, the way that works is that um, when God exiled the northern tribes into Assyria in the 700s B.C., he then brought the, the Assyrians then brought pagans. They took pagans from their lands and exiled them to that land of Israel. There were a couple Israelites left there, and then these pagans were there, and they started intermarrying. So you end up with this mixed group that were called Samaritans. At first, they were worshiping false gods, and then like wild animals started killing them. And so then they said, we need to bring a priest of the people who used to live here to tell us what to do not to make the God of this land mad. So they brought some Levites back, and those Levites said, well, you can't be worshiping these other gods. And so what happened is you had this group eventually peel off the paganism, and they worship the one God of Israel, but in a very unique Samaritan way that rejected what real Jews were doing. So, for example, they said the temple's not in Jerusalem. God always picked the temple on Mount Gezerim. Convenient, that's where the Samaritans lived, you know. And so um, you have this really this rival Judaism, and, and it's still there today. There are still Samaritans in that spot today that have carried on their traditions for 2,000 years now. Um, so, um, so yeah, and, and there, again, a lot of hatred between them. When Antiochus IV was killing the Jews and desecrated their temple, the Samaritans said, hey, we're not even Jews. They've been saying they're the real Jews for the longest time. But once persecution came, they said, oh, we're not Jews at all. We want nothing to do with the Jews. And in fact, we'll dedicate our temple to Zeus. You don't even have to come in and do this. And so that spared them. And then they even sent soldiers to help Antiochus um, take over Jerusalem. So the real Jews never forgot. And so once the Seleucids were, were forced out, then around the year 110 B.C., under uh, uh, John Hyrcanus, the Jews went into Samaria and they burnt the temple on Mount, Ge Mount Gezerim down to the ground. Said, this is a false temple. You're not going to call on the name of our God at this temple. And so, again, you had that animosity. So when you read the New Testament and you see how Jews and Samaritans hate each other, there's some history there. And, and so it's, it's, it's worth knowing that. Um, the New Testament also briefly mentions uh, a group called the Herodians. Okay, the Herodians were just people who were loyal to the family of Herod, and they were staunch Hellenists. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> the average people didn't like them. What's crazy, though, is Pharisees and Herodians would hate each other, but they hated Jesus more to where sometimes they'd work together to work against Jesus. That's crazy. That's crazy. And so these passages that I put at the, the bottom of the screen are just places where you will find these groups except for the Essenes mentioned. Okay, So let's quickly talk about Jewish influence of Christianity because that's the point of all this. It's not just to give you a history lesson of Israel in that time. It's to tell you why this is all important. Okay, And so the Jews contributed a great deal to the church. Christians are monotheists. Okay? We worship one God and one God alone. Where did that idea come from? The Jews. We believe in the God of Israel, so it's the same God. Our morality and our ethics come from the law and the prophets. And the New Testament's just a commentary on the law and the prophets and the ethics of the law and the prophets. And so that's where we get our morality. Where do you think we get two-thirds of our scripture? It's the Old Testament. Okay? Um, and the, where do you think we get our idea of church, the ecclesia, where you have local bodies meeting together? It's the synagogue. That comes out of the synagogue. And if you read some stuff from the Mishnah, which likely recorded at a later time some traditions that were happening in the time of Christ, the synagogue had a very, very clear set of worship. There was a call to worship. Then there was the public reading of Scripture. Then there was the explanation of the Scripture and then a sermon with it, right? I mean, think about that. That's exactly what churches have been doing ever since. And they set up a specific text to be read on specific Saturdays. Um, and, and so if you look at most Christian denominations, whether it's Catholic or Greek Orthodox or even um, Presbyterian and, uh, and Anglican, they have what are called lectionaries where certain passages are read on certain dates. It's already picked because it's, a, it's a, a liturgical calendar that idea was taken from the Jews. 
Now, we Protestants, especially we Baptists, we're like, we don't need no lectionaries. We just go book by book, chapter by chapter, which I think is a better way to do it anyway. But the church did take a lot from the synagogue. Uh, baptism, they had uh, their mikvahs, their ritual washings. Christianity says, well, we believe that, but a one-time deal where it symbolizes you leaving your old life and identifying with Christ. The Lord's Supper, that came out of Passover. In fact, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper during Israel's most important feast, Passover. So it comes out of it. And then just the very idea of the Christ, the Messiah, um, is a Jewish idea. So we got a lot from them. Uh, the, the, the Jews contributed to the church a high view of Scripture. Um, the, the idea that Paul's statement that all Scripture is God-breathed, and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and uh, training for righteousness. That was the standard view held by all groups. Even, the, even though you had these groups disagreeing with each other, they all held that. They all believed that about the Word. They didn't disagree over the inspiration of the Word. They disagreed over the interpretation of the Word. But they all held a high view of the Word. They had uh, particular systems of interpretation. That's what hermeneutics means, so peshat. Um, a lot of most Christians use that early on. Peshat just means plain sense, literal interpretation of Scripture. Now, midrash was something that the rabbis were fond of doing, and Paul will do this sometimes. Midrash is where you take a bunch of scriptures and you kind of put them together to build a doctrine. Okay, uh, so that's midrash. Pesher, New Testament's filled with Pesher. This was something that um, the Essenes did a lot in the Dead Sea. Pesher is where you say that. Um, a lot of the Old Testament was a mystery. Okay, God revealed it, but it was hidden in plain sight. And we need an interpretive key. That interpretive key is the Messiah. Now that he's come, all this stuff that was hidden is now brought to light. The whole New Testament pushes that idea because it's true. Well, the hermeneutical view is called Pesher. So we, we get that from the Jews. Allegory. Now, you know that the early church went crazy with allegory. Uh, not the earliest church, but like the third and fourth centuries, they went nuts with allegory to the point where they allegorize it to where the text can't possibly mean what they thought. But where do they get it from? Paul did use allegory in Galatians 4. Um, now, Paul, that was the only time he used it. The vast majority of the time Paul quotes scripture, it's Peshat, the plain sense. But in that case, he made a point with allegory. And I think there's a way you could use allegory that doesn't go against the text. The early church <laughs> did not do a good job. And so that's why when the Re Reformation happened, they're like, all right, just get rid of allegory. You know, nothing good's come from it. It has been just a, a garbage show for the last couple thousand years. Um, well, 1,500 years. And so that's why um, in the Protestant tradition, we don't allegorize as much. But again, I think you don't have to throw the whole baby out with the bathwater um, in, in, in that sense. And, and where did allegory come from? The Greeks. Um, so the Greeks eventually, some of them started thinking, all right, you know, our most famous literature, the Iliad, um, it's talking about these gods doing some really stupid things. And this just can't be real. So let's, if we're going to take this serious, let's allegorize all of these as like metaphorical pictures of higher principles. And so that's what the allegorists did. You get some Jews like Philo in Egypt that tried to do the same thing with the Old Testament. Um, and some of that was embraced by Christians in the third century, again, to a degree that they should not have embraced it. But anyhow, my point with all that is we take some hermeneutical ideas from them. Another point, uh, we take the idea of the kingdom of God, the, the present uh, and future ages. The, the Jews have these two ages, the Olam Hazeh, the present evil age, and then the Olam Haba, the perfect age to come. Now, you might not hear that a lot because a lot of Christians don't think in the Jewish terms that, are, that the first Christians did. But I challenge you, in your New Testament uh, software, type in present evil age, see how many times it comes up. Type in perfect age or age to come, see how many times it comes up. The New Testament authors bring this two-age dichotomy up all the time. That comes out of Judaism. Apocalyptism also comes out of Judaism. Okay? And so my point with all this is the New Testament is thoroughly Jewish. Okay. Now, just uh, one more thing, and then we'll, we'll get to the conclusion. Uh, it wasn't until after the death of the apostles that the church left its Jewish flavor and began to be dominated by more Western or Occidental thinking. 
Um, and so when you look at the theology and the practice of the or Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church, it, they lost sight of their Jewish roots. And even in some of the early church councils where they solidified the Trinity and, and the hypostatic union of Christ, things we'll be talking about, what is lesser known is in those same councils, they also outlawed uh, Judaism. They would, they would, now that they had the government power behind them, they suppressed uh, Judaism. And it, you, if you kept Passover as a Christian, it was on pain of death. Um, and so, uh, so pretty much, um, yeah, they're going to do some things that just move far away from our roots. And, and that's, not, that's not good. Um, the Protestants, when, when the Reformation restored sola scriptura to the place it needs to be, that was great, but they still didn't quite go back and, and regain some of those roots. And when I talk about roots, I'm not talking about all of us practicing Torah. I'm just saying to understand the New Testament in its context, you got to understand Second Temple Judaism better. And, you know, it would protect us from some of the false doctrine that has been going around for 1,800 years. Um, and so, yeah, you, 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 got, you got that. Um, and then I think one, the perfect blend of this, in my opinion, is Paul. I mean, if you think about it, I'll put the slide back up for the stream. Paul is a good mix of everything that was talked about in these two lectures, right? He was a Jew, so he's an Oriental that's raised in the East, yet he was educated in Western culture. He could quote their poets and philosophers off the top of his head just as easily as he could quote Scripture. He didn't believe in what those guys said. He knew them so he could refute them, and he refuted them with a scriptural worldview. He spoke Hebrew. That much is obvious because his name is Shaul, and only when he's in Gentile lands does he call himself Paulus or Paul. Furthermore, some of the things he writes in his letters is, even though it's Greek, you could tell it's translating Hebrew. So he must have had an original Hebrew sometimes that he would translate. So he communicated in both Hebrew, yet he mostly wrote in Koine Greek. He had Roman citizenship to assist his mission work, and yet he said he was a Hebrew of Hebrews and a son of Pharisees, right? He took pride in his Jewish heritage, being a son of the tribe of Benjamin. And he had a burdened heart for Israel, yet all of his work was mainly for the people of the nations. Paul really was the perfect blend of all of this. Above everything else, he was a follower of Jesus, which makes him a Christian. He was a completed Jew. You know, the idea that you are either a Christian or a Jew and you can't be both is absolutely silly. If you're a Jew that believes in Christ, you don't cease being a Jew any more than a Gentile believing in Christ ceases to be a Gentile. Okay. The point is God is building a church of what? Both Jew and Gentile and bringing us in unity without erasing our identity. Okay. And I think Paul is the perfect example of that. So with all that, here's the conclusion. We have now closed the gap uh, between the Old and New Testaments. Uh, and, and so what we've seen is the political situation changed through the succession of Persian, Greek, and Roman empires. We've seen the culture of those empires all converge on the, in, in, on the land of Israel, but also outside of it. Um, historically, the Hebrew faith developed from Ezra's time all the way to Christ's time, and that's uh, what helps us understand the differences between how Judaism is at the end of Malachi and how it is at the start of Matthew. Uh, the various Greek and Roman philosophies that are seen in Scripture, you now know what they are. So when you see Paul arguing with Stoics and Epicureans, you know who they are. When you hear about Samaritans, you know who they are. When Jesus is arguing with Pharisees, you know who they are. When Paul is being put on trial before the Sanhedrin and he mentions he's put on trial for the resurrection and the Pharisees come to his defense and the Sadducees are still against him, you now understand what's going on there, right? All this is to help you understand what you see when you get to the New Testament. And so the point is, if you put it all together, okay, what we have is we have uh, Roman roads connecting every city. We have the diaspora, meaning we have Jews, which means we have synagogues and a Greek Old Testament in every city. You have sea currents to get you faster to those places. The sea currents understood. You have the, the various Jewish uh, groups that you, you come across in the New Testament. You got the single language being spoke by almost everybody. Okay, It was the first language of people in the eastern half of the empire, second language of people in the western half, um, all this kind of stuff. And it all literally converges, all the stuff I mentioned, to create the world of the New Testament. Um, and it's what then creates the world of the early church. So with that, 
I'm going to uh, have Angel um, stop the recording, and then I'll take questions. Let me know when 